further ado, I want to welcome our guest of honor, Aaron. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is kind of exciting. First time in this building too with the vault is super cool. A uh, quick show of hands, who is an entrepreneur? Oh man, that's a lot of people. Who's in technology but not necessarily like an entrepreneur? Okay, a lot of the same people, but that's okay. And then who's not in technology but wants to be in technology? Oh, okay, all right, so this is a tech crowd. All right, good to know. Um, well, really quickly about me, uh, I'll talk about a little bit of my journey, but these are some of the things that keep me busy. And uh, let me tell you how it started. So early in my career, this was my vision of what it meant to be an investor. You know, now I think entrepreneurship is actually like cooler than investing, but that was not the case even 10 years ago. Like my vision of the investor was you kind of sit back, you put your feet up and everybody comes to you and you say, yes, no, 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 yes, maybe, no, no, no. And that just seemed really cool. So I tried very hard to figure out how to break into venture capital. And I finally did. Uh, I was 29 and I grudgingly accepted a summer MBA internship four years after I finished my MBA just to get my foot in the door. And it was really, really interesting because I got to see all the things that you see at a tier one venture capital firm. The main thing that you do there is, as a VC associate, you just kind of sit and listen to companies talk. You don't even really ask questions because you don't know enough. You let the partners ask all the questions. But I got to sit there and see this dialogue back and forth, both sides of the table. The questions that the investors would ask and the answers that the entrepreneurs would give. And I'll tell you one thing. While the entrepreneurs always seemed like way more stressed, because <laughs> they were, they were also having a lot more fun. They were the ones who had the passion. You know, the investors were sort of sitting back and saying, no, no, yes, that's really cool. It's a hot deal, it's not a hot deal. Let's negotiate good terms. But the entrepreneurs, they were living and breathing like a dream. Um, and so I figured I, I needed to try to do that instead. So I tried to leave venture capital and I started a business with a co-founder called Better You. This was in 2011. 2010? No, 20, 2009. 2009. Um, it was a marketplace, call it, or a wellness, fitness, professional marketplace. So basically, you'd hire a personal trainer or a massage therapist online. Simple. But it really sucked. I mean, I failed miserably on a lot of fronts. And by doing that, I learned a lot, but I'll tell you some of the things that I screwed up pretty badly in the beginning. It was the wrong time for this business. You know, this is 2009, but you kind of needed mobile, you needed more online penetration, you needed a lot of other things for people to be comfortable booking massage therapists online. That business is now exists, but it, it happened years later. So timing is important. I also had the wrong team. I mean, we were building a tech marketplace and I didn't have anybody in tech on my team <laughs> to build it. And really, the whole thing after you build the tech is all about marketing. And I didn't have anybody good at marketing on my team. So I had the wrong team. Also, it really wasn't my passion. I mean, I enjoy getting massages, but I'm not particularly passionate about the field. Um, so it wasn't something that was good that I cared about. Also, we were dramatically underfunded. The product sucked, and we weren't focused. So on to the next. Um, realized that if I was going to start something, it had to be a bit more natural. It had to feel right. It had to feel like mine. And I didn't know what that was, so I kind of gave up and I went back to working in venture capital and I was doing some consulting and a bunch of fun things were happening and who knows. So what is this problem? Well, my wife, my beautiful wife who's sitting up here in the front row, when we went to visit our families, we lived in Los Angeles at the time, we went to visit our families on the East Coast, and we came back after leaving our two dogs in a kennel for 10 days, 
to a $1,400 bill, and my dog Rocky was hiding under my desk for three days because something happened. She was traumatized. And we thought, man, this is weird. Like, you're paying over $1,000 to have your dog in a cage 23 hours a day and not have any idea what's going on? That seems like kind of stupid. So what can we do? So again, credit to my genius wife who, who said, hey, I've heard of this business called Yelp. This is 2010? Nine, 10? I heard of this business called Yelp. I'm putting you on Yelp. It's called Aaron's Dog Boarding. I'm putting on your cell phone number. And are we being recorded? Yes. And she did not have friends write any fake reviews. <laughs> and the next thing that you know, and when I say next thing, it must have been three months later, I got a call from a woman who said, I'm so glad you answered the phone. My friend just canceled on me. Do you have any spots left for tonight? And I said, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number. What are you talking about? She said, isn't this Aaron's dog boarding? And I was like, oh yeah, sorry. We're having phone difficulties. I'm really sorry about that. Um, let me check the calendar. We have one spot left for tonight. All right, what do you, what do you charge? $50 a night? I'll be there in five minutes. Boom, my first customer. The dog was Chelsea. I don't remember the human. Uh, I, remember, I don't remember her name. And we had a great time. Chelsea and my dogs, Rocky and Rambo, we played all weekend. I had so much fun. My wife said she's never seen me happier. Um, and we were sending her text message photos. Like, that's a big deal back in 2009-10. Uh, she wrote a glowing five-star reel review. And then the phone started ringing. And the next thing we knew, we were fielding seven or eight calls a day for dog boarding, and we turned our house basically into a, a kennel. I mean, a loving home environment. And so this was born my, my second business, Dog Vacay. I, I dug up, as I was preparing this presentation, I dug up two slides from my initial Series A pitch. Uh, our Series A run was led by Benchmark, one of the top tier firms in, in the world. Um, so it was really embarrassing when I found this, but I'm gonna put it in here. This was my Series A pitch explaining how Dog Vacay works. If any of you are on, no, don't, don't take pictures of it. It's a terrible slide. <laughs> this is terrible. Never, ever, ever have this many words. It's just bad. But, you know, find the perfect dog, schedule a book online, simple, trust, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that was one, and then this is one I actually liked a little bit. We, we talked about how we had something new. We had people who were not like professional dog sitters that were trying to watch lots of dogs. We had regular folks who were like, oh my God, I can make 40 bucks per dog per night and hang out and have fun? I'll do that. And these people were the ones who really made our business successful. They loved what we were doing. Um, yeah, so Joanne in Miami, I remember her. Brian, I remember him. So I'm gonna talk about a few phases of this business. Um, man, if you're not a tech guy, which is apparently nobody in this room, but I don't buy that, like I'm not a tech guy, it's really hard to build a website, especially if you don't even know where to start. And uh, so honestly, our website never even would have launched if I didn't have what's called a PR embargo. Anybody know what this is? So basically, we had three or four uh, companies like TechCrunch, again, huge deal, you gotta put yourself back to, 2010 now, 2011. Um, if it weren't for that, we probably would have kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, but we had this hard deadline, and the hard deadline was so freaking scary, but we had to get it out. So the week before, you know, we did everything, we barely got it out. Um, our launch was a successful day in that the website didn't crash, but guess what? We couldn't even take payments. Our first customer, the credit card field, this is also not being recorded, Okay. The credit card field was basically a text form that would email us the credit card number, which we would then manually input into the payment gateway. And, you know, but we got the product out. We got it out. And it, for lack of a better word, like it was working. People were on the website. Um, as a side note, it was one of my favorite stories. Uh, I launched this business on March 1st, 2012. 
And I was sitting right next to a gentleman named Michael Dubin, who's the founder of a company called Dollar Shave Club, if you guys know it. They sold to Unilever for a billion dollars. So he sat right next to me before launch. And if any of you remember, he had this very cool like viral video. It, it, anyway, so he launches his website five days later, and we're kind of friendly competition. And this video goes viral. Ashton Kutcher tweets it. Again, big deal back in whatever. And the website's down. And I'm like, hey, sorry, buddy. You know, maybe there's always your next company. I guess you fucked up your launch. Um, so, you know, the launch is it's just the beginning. Like, it, it's just the beginning. Next thing we know, this is a picture, it's hard to see, but this is a picture of changing the engine mid-flight. And that's what it felt like, because all of a sudden, I can't even take credit cards, but I've got customers giving me their credit cards. Like, what do we do? And it felt like the next year or two is just scrambling to try to add the things that would make it work the way we originally intended when we planned it, but that when we launched, it wasn't working. It's a weird feeling, because you're, you're, you just feel like you're always on your heels. Um, <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. Um, <clears throat> And when you have customers, everything changes. When you have revenue, everything changes. All of a sudden, investors who wouldn't give me the time of day, who thought that a silly dog sitting idea is, has no place in venture capital, I'm like, well, look at my revenue. <laughs> I have customers, they're buying, they're repeating. Everything changes. Now you're not just attracting this narrow niche of investors who like dogs and are willing to take a risk on this concept, now anybody who can do math is suddenly interested in your business. And it was wild. I mean, it was really wild. So for about three years, we were growing like crazy. The first year, I think, was about a million in revenue. The next year was 10 million in revenue. The next year uh, was almost 30. So this is really fast growth. And again, in hindsight, I give myself very little credit for this. And I'll tell you why in the, in the end. But then comes the part that actually happens to almost every business. And uh, um, an investor of mine named Jeff Jordan at Andreessen Horowitz wrote this really cool article called The Oh Shit Moment. Um, so I highly recommend you read it, it's short. It never just goes up and to the right. It never does. Well, there's one or two companies, but it really never does for any of us normal people. And uh, so we got one, 10, 30, and then my projections were 90, to go from 30 to 90. And we went from 30 to like 52. That sounds okay, right? Like 30 to 52, what's that? That's a lot of growth, that's millions of dollars. Oh, that's game over, right? Missed plan by like 50%, unit economics terrible, don't have any handle on our metrics, all of a sudden all this natural growth that we had from all these early adopters, now it's like, well, where are the next customers gonna come from? And all of a sudden it felt like it got really hard in a different way. Not hard because I was trying to keep the website up and keep it running, but because I needed to actually grow the business and I had no idea how. And that was really scary. So what I call phase five, for lack of a better word, is when I actually started figuring out what the heck to do with this thing. Um, there's no right answer, but it is about these three things, people, accountability, and metrics. If you don't have good people, it doesn't matter. As a founder, CEO, you can't do stuff. You can't do everything yourself. You just can't. You need other people. You have to have accountability, so when you hire these great people, you gotta make sure that they know what they're doing, that they know what their goal is, and that it's aligned with everybody else's goals. And the only way you do that is through metrics. Oh, so um, I'm happy to talk more about it, but I essentially had to rebuild my management team. I realized that all the people that I was able to convince to join me in the beginning for barely no salary, and they actually weren't the right people to take us to the next level. And I had to make the really hard decision of letting a lot of people go who, even though they had a great history with the company, they brought a lot of passion and puppy love. Our business at the time needed more than passion and puppy love. We needed hard work, accountability, great people, metrics. And we, we turned it around. Uh, we, we've grown the business to over 100 million in revenue and started to think about how to negotiate a way out. Now, I could have kept going. Uh, this is, I like this one. You, know, you gotta know when to hold them, when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. 
Um, I took a look at, an honest look at our position. We had two, com two main competitors besides the kennels and all that other stuff. We had a company called Rover, which is a, a version of us, but essentially exactly the same product with a little bit bigger. We had a company called WAG, who some of you guys have heard of, which is a mobile dog boarding company. And we were a lot bigger than them, but they had a good product and they were growing faster. And I sort of felt like I was stuck in the middle. Like I have a company behind me with slightly better technology that's growing faster and a company a little ahead of me with a little bit more money. And so I either have to figure out, I have to figure out what makes us unique um, and execute on some sort of story around that. Or I could try to sell the business. And it felt like the right time. And so I began a process to figure out a way to exit the business. We talked to Rover, we talked to WAG, we talked to Chewy, we talked to PetSmart, we talked to Petco, we talked to everyone and ultimately found that the best way to do it for all of our shareholders was to combine with Rover, which we did. Uh, Rover's now a, wait, I don't know what I have. Oh no, okay. Yeah, so Rover is a, we merged with Rover, an extremely successful integration. The company now is doing hundreds of millions in, in revenue. It's a, essentially a billion dollar company now and um, it's kind of surreal to watch all that happen and have nothing to do with it. Because what I've got going on is, Wait, and the morning that the, I remember it so vividly, it was oh God, Thursday morning or Wednesday morning. I don't know why, but the call with this Delaware corporate was at like 5.30 a.m. to close the deal and we closed the deal and then all of a sudden, like all the stress was gone. Everything was gone. You, for seven years, you're kind of shaking and everything's crazy and then it's literally gone. No one reports to me anymore. I don't have any employees. I don't have any responsibilities. I don't even have an identity. I mean, it's very strange when your whole life for years is this one thing and then gone. Very strange. So time to move to Florida. Oh, I had a slide on it. Yeah, so this is Dog Vacay Rover today. Um, we've got over 250,000 sitters and walkers on the platform. We've raised over 300 million and definitely on path to an IPO. Again, I've got nothing to do with it. So let's talk about some of the lessons that learned along the way. Okay. I'm going to tell you some things that I learned and then I'm going to tell you how I sort of apply them as an investor, which I do today. Ideas are a dime a fucking dozen. I'm sorry. Like, if you have an idea, I don't care. You got to do it. Everyone talks, talks, talks. Timing really matters. The example of, of Better You, I started the business at the wrong time. I started Dog Vacay at the right time. If I had started Dog Vacay two years later, other people would have started and named it something way better. Um, timing is critical, and I actually think it's one of the most important things in determining the success of a company. Do less stuff. I mean, in the beginning, you feel like you're running around with like a chicken with your head cut off. Really, it's about focus. It's about deciding all the things that you're not going to do. The best strategy says, here are a thousand things we're going to do. Excuse me, here are a thousand things that we could do, and here's 900, you know, 997 that we're not. And we're all looking at each other in the eyes and agreeing that we're not going to do these things, and we're not going to get distracted because we have one number to hit. Really, really important. When I see entrepreneurs doing too many things, it's a huge red flag. Obviously, people matter. It's the most important thing. And I'm starting a new company now, and I've got, the, frankly, the privilege of being able to hire some really good people with high salaries early on. And it's something I didn't have a chance to do before. So when taking that, like what I learned as an entrepreneur, and I go back into venture capital or angel investing, which is really more of what I do now, I have a lot of direct applications, and it's been interesting to go through. I put this at number zero, okay? So this is not number one, this is number zero on purpose. If you don't have a large market with unit economics at scale, you really don't need venture capital money at all. So why are you talking to me? So this is sort of the pre, like you at least need this, need this to have the conversation. It's not to say that you can't have an incredible business without venture capital. Most businesses that generate cash are way cooler, but if for venture, you need this. Right place, right time. No? 
I thought that would get laughs. Okay. The founding team has to have a reason to be there. Um, I watched dogs for a year in my house, 130-something. We watched a lot of dogs. This is a problem that was true to us. I had a reason to solve this problem. I've seen entrepreneurs who are intellectual about a problem. And I don't think that that really, it doesn't work as well. You don't have the drive if it's an intellectual problem you're solving. I think it has to be something emotional. So I look for a team that's connected to what they're doing, even if it's something simple. Focus on execution, obviously. We want people who know exactly what they're doing and exactly what they're not doing. Understanding of the critical metrics. A lot of times I'll ask someone, hey, what are your, what are your critical metrics? And they'll go a list of 10, 12, 15. I'm like, no. What's your one? Because everything rolls up. You've got to have, if you have 15, what are you really focusing on? Oh, man, it's like, you, you, people know this. It's trite, but when you work with bad people, it just sucks the life out of you. So how I try to add value as an investor, again, I'm shameless plug, I guess. 95% of the value that investors add is that first bullet point. It's just money. We talk a game about trying to add value and connections, and the reality is, like, you need the money. Get the money. And then, I'm gonna let you do your thing. I'm investing in you. So you're the boss. I'll give you my ideas, but I will never say you should do this. I might say, if I were in your situation, I would consider doing it this way, but you're the boss. I acknowledge the opportunity cost of my ideas. So I might say, I met these gentlemen here do a business called Simple Puppy, also in the pet space. Um, and if I said, hey, you should try to do a mobile grooming roll-up and do that as your business, I acknowledge that if you were to actually do that, that would be a complete distraction from everything else that you're doing. And investors constantly are coming up with ideas like, try this, try this, another company tried that. I think that that's not mature. I think as an investor, you need to be able to say, focus, <laughs> focus. Oh, and stupid intros like, oh, uh, oh, my friend's a dog sitter. Let me put you in touch. Like, no, why? So flipping it, because I've been in both, both, both sides of the table, so to speak, here's what I advise you guys on. I'm doing good on time, right? Yeah. Fundraising is the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make. It's the hardest part, right? Like you need to, it, it's life or death. You really aren't good at raising money because you're good at running your business. It's not a core competency. So the single most important piece of advice that I give entrepreneurs when they approach fundraising is to be strategic and run a process. What typically happens is you talk to one-off investors, you take a coffee, you get an intro, and it's all kind of haphazard. What you want to do is have a controlled process. So for our Series A, for example, we had three different groups of investors. A, B, C. A were the guys that we really, really wanted. B were the guys that, yeah, we take their money, and they're okay. And C were the guys that were like, fuck, we'll take their money, but we really don't want to. And with each one, we had targeted, friendly introductions to each one. I never reached out, it was always a mutual acquaintance that said, hey, this group is raising their Series A, really cool traction, cool idea, do you want to talk to them? And we sequenced it, so we talked to the Cs first. We got all our feedback, we got all the VC questions, all the questions about unit economics and customer service and how it scales, and we modified the deck, and now that pitch got really good by that seventh or eighth time with all the people that I didn't really want to care about. Then we did the A's. So then I went to Benchmark, and I went to Andreessen Horowitz, and we already, they already knew we were doing a process. Everyone talks in that area. They knew there was time pressure. They knew this was their chance. And then we went to the Bs, and they're like, shit, you're talking to Andreessen and Benchmark? Like, we're gonna lean in really hard. And everybody knows, and all of a sudden, you create a sense of urgency, and nothing gets people to write a check like urgency. FOMO, fear of missing out, it's real. When you talk to investors, um, be very careful about what you share and then what you share the next time. 
Because if you have a conversation and then a month later have another conversation with that same investor and you're in exactly the same spot in your business, deal's over. You're not getting their money. You need to show momentum in every conversation. Last time I talked to you, I said I was gonna do this. I did this, here are the results. Now here's what we're gonna do. And if you want, I'll tell you in a couple months how that goes. Um, you can also be sneaky about it and not share everything in that first meeting and then talk about something that you accomplished in the second meeting that maybe you'd already accomplished, but you're showing momentum. It's very, very critical. This is just a pet peeve of mine. Like, if you have a business that's like dog sitting, don't sign an NDA. Like, who cares? Ideas are a dime a dozen. Let's talk about the business. Let's talk about you. That's what's gonna make this thing successful. I hear, I talked with another entrepreneur last night, um, should, I, should I price my seed round at five million or, or four and a half, should I price it at four or six? It's all made up, who cares? You need money, this is a binary outcome. You are either going to be successful or you are not. And if you're gonna turn down half a million dollars on three points of dilution, you're crazy. Get the money in the bank and do your thing, especially if it's your first company. You don't have a choice. Like, it's all about that money. So just get it in the bank. Don't worry about valuation. And then, of course, remember to spend time with your loved ones, sleep, eat healthy, and exercise. <laughs> uh, I started a new company, which is really cool. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you about it. But I think it's the right place, the right time. I think I'm the right person. I have a lot of credibility. And we're doing something really big that I'm really passionate about. So I'm excited to, uh, to go on this new journey. That's it. Okay. Uh, so for anyone in the room that has a marketplace, that's trying to build a marketplace, part one of the question is, you know, there's always this, you know, which side do you build first and at what point do you flip the switch? Uh, so I'll start with that before going on to part two. Any, any marketplace businesses here? Ah, okay, it's a lot. Marketplace businesses is like um, Airbnb. You have drive, uh, you have hosts and customers, or Uber. You have drivers and passengers. So, you're, the success of your business is managing this entire flow. With marketplaces, you need to start with supply, right? Because you can't even fill demand if you don't have supply, um, and then. You have to worry about disintermediation, which is another big piece, which is how do you get people to actually stay on your platform? With Dog Vacay, I'd say 95% of the time, the first question that I was asked was, what's to keep people from going around your platform the second time? It's the most common question. Um, you have to make the experience really good. And this is not, there's no single, single answer to this. Uh, so we talked about, we had insurance, we had, guaranteed booking, we had um, a search algorithm that penalized people who disintermediated and raised people who did not. So you're constantly hacking away at, at that, depending on the, the marketplace, you've got different risks of that. Uh, but that's something that was critical for us at Dog VK. So, as an early user of Dog VK, I still use the lady that I met on Dog VK like four or five years later. Uh, and insurance was what kept me going through. I'm like, as much as I know her, you know, in case anything would ever happen, the insurance and knowing that that was kind of available to me, I think it's what kept me. Uh, so that was actually part two of my question, the disintermediation. Yeah, I mean, it was probably, insurance was one of our innovations. I mean, you guys remember 2011, I think it was, Airbnb had this uh, issue where like a, uh, a guest trashed a house, and, and Airbnb's response was, we're just an online marketplace. We've got nothing to do with this. We're just connecting people. And that was not a good PR move. Um, and eventually, that whole thing led them to institute things like the host guarantee and insurance policies. But we were really early with that. I, nobody knew what we were doing, so I had to kind of piece together three or four different companies and different plans so that we could make those claims and actually support it. Um, but the reality is our insurance, we basically paid 98% out of pocket. All basically self-insured. Because nobody would really 
ensure the things that we were doing. Aaron, my, my question is a personal one. Uh, you're a husband, father of three. How did Aaron, husband, father of three, and tech entrepreneur of a billion dollar company manage stress at the height of it? <laughs> I can't ask you. Not very well, or not at all. Uh, I feel great now. <laughs> but a any tips on, on you know, do's and don'ts? Or? I think um, the most important thing for me was getting people in place that I could trust and that I could step away for a day or a week and things were still happening. And once I had that feeling, it sort of flipped a switch for me of like, you eventually have to say, look, it might not be done perfectly, but at least I'm not the one doing it. <laughs> and that's important. Uh, so you have to let good enough be good and let the people do their thing. And um, it's hard. I, I don't think there's an answer. I think to run this company and start this company while we had three kids, we had three little kids, um, was exhausting. It was stressful. Um, and that is part of the reason why I said, I think, maybe yeah, I should. Because I think my alternative to selling at that point was to really grind it out for another five to seven years. Because <coughs> it probably would have taken that long as a standalone company to get to IPO. And seven more years of that sounded rough. Like, let me figure out how to, how to move on. So last night at dinner, you mentioned that you were convinced you didn't want to start another company and that you were just going to invest and live a light, nice life. Uh, so what made you finally decide, you know, this is the time and this is the product that I want to launch? I, so my new company is around um, regenerative medicine or stem cells and, and pets. And there's a lot of advantages to working with pets from a regulatory perspective and, and from a lifetime perspective. Dogs get old in like 10 years compared to humans in 70 something years. So you have a lot of opportunities. And, I'm just like, why is nobody doing this? This is the most obvious answer right now. Like, I figured out a way to make this work. Why is nobody doing this? Why doesn't it exist? So it's going to exist in a year or two, whether or not I do it. And I'm like, I got to be the one. It just, it pulled me in and I don't, but I'm trying to work less hard. <laughs> I have other people who are really good doing a lot of the hard stuff right now. And I've, I've learned the things that I'm good at and the things that other people are a lot better at. And I'm focusing on the things that I'm good at and letting other people do all those other things. Whereas the first and second businesses, I tried to do everything. All right, we're gonna turn it over to you guys. Raise your hand and I'll try to run over in heels as quickly as possible. So uh, my question goes to, you mentioned at some point the company didn't grow like fast enough, so you realize that you have a company that was bigger than um, yours, that was Robert, and you have one behind you that was WAG, that was bringing the walking on demand, that was new at, at, at that point in the, the moment. So my question goes in, um, so you, you have some options. You, you got the options of continue working, trying to get the company to grow fast enough, as was expected at that point, or to sell the company. So if you decided to continue to grow your company, um, one of the ideas were to bring new services and new type of pets to your platform, or if not, why not? Like, let's say pet grooming, dog training, you know, I, I understand. services. And his question is sort of like, if you're, if you're caught in the middle, if, you, if you're trying to differentiate, like, how might you think about doing that? And it, might it be cats, right? Or could it be gerbils or whatever your, your market is? Um, especially in the world of venture capital, you're competing for, like, very narrow attention set. There's 50 firms that matter, 100 firms that matter, and they're not going to invest in 10 different dog sitting companies. So your size and growth rate like, our business at 70, 80 million in revenue might have been an awesome business by a lot of standards, but relative to one other company in this space, we were smaller, and relative to another company, we were growing slower, and those were the comparison points. Um, so I think it's a, almost a false comparison set up by venture capital to say, like, oh, your $70 million business sucks. 
Um, that's really not true, but from the perspective of raising money and continuing this game of investing in customers, you actually need to play it. And so we looked at lots of different ways we could differentiate. We looked at it from a product perspective. We looked at it from a geographic perspective. Let's go to Latin America. Let's go to Europe. Uh, we looked at it a lot of ways, and all of them required a good amount of investment and core capabilities that we did not have on the team today. So in order to pull those off would require money and hiring. And at that point, I'm like, we should just keep doing what we're doing because we're not doing terribly. So that was sort of what drove the decision. But, defi but definitely, do you think is you know, there are opportunities in this kind of businesses, in other services, like, you know, bringing on demand, pet grooming, dog training. Um. Huge, market. Huge market, lots of opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. How you doing, boss? Great talk. So my name is John. I'm also building a marketplace, and we recently just launched this year. And I have this case that I know it's a good, thing that is happening because we are disrupting this industry and the way how one of the things that we're doing is adding the rating system, the feedback. People give a feedback not only for the employee, the company to the employees, but the employee to the company. So my marketplace is connect servers and bartenders from local restaurants with catering companies. So it's the first time for these people that they're gonna bring, they're gonna bring in the same platform with the competition, and in some way they, f they fear of, okay, I, besides catering, which is the food quality and the experience, they have the staff. So they feel, I don't want my, the people that I employ being working with competition because also they're gonna be rating you. So I know that that actually is gonna improve the standards of the industry because now they need to get better at what they do to make that difference in terms of the quality of the people that you're able to hire. But I am facing from time to time this kind of like issue for them saying, oh, now I don't want to be in the same platform with my competition in this, in this form. But the reason is because now I'm bringing a new supply to this industry because these people are not, it's a, they don't do this. So I'm bringing a new supplier for them, but then I'm also saying, okay, you wanna have the best talent, you need, to, you need to be in the same platform as everyone. So do you have any thought of that? So if I understand, you have a platform where you're bringing in new chefs or cooks, essentially? Okay. Along, and there is existing ones that you're trying to get on as well. So that's, that's analogous to maybe my challenge of having a professional pet sitter on the platform has been doing it for years and views dog vacate partly as competition, but partly as lead gen compared to a stay at home mom or a retiree yeah. who is like, sure, I'll do it. Right. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> good luck. Hello, my name is Laura, and um, thank you so much for your experience. It's very like, enriched for me. <laughs> but um, I have two questions. The first one is, is there something that you should do different? Like at this point that the company sold and you was seven years on this, is there something that you says, you step back and you says, oh, I should do that on this time. I should do this different. I should call this person before. That's the first question. And the second question is, how do you do to, with these, all these sitters that you found, the people that is great, that they walk the dogs from your app, but then I'm an owner as well, and I just want that person, I don't want anyone on demand, and I want to cancel her and not up to the app, to all these problems. So how do you do with these sitters that don't just go with their customers on their side, and if there's something that you might do different. Thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you. So uh, first question around what I would do different, like it, the question isn't, is there one thing? The question is, are there like 7,000 or 10,000? I mean, there are so many things that I could have, would have, should have done differently. Um, so that's all night and go on forever. Uh, the other question is that same one around disintermediation. It was the most common question that investors would give us. And so it was always a combination of 
of factors around insurance, like she talked about, and, and your search algorithm. For example, and you may have this with your business, if we had a dog sitter, a host, who was going off the platform, what that would look like is they get a booking and then they don't get any more bookings. That's what it looks like to us. So if we see a dog sitter who's get, who gets a booking and then no more bookings, it means one of two things. It means they're shitty and the person's not coming back or they're disintermediating. Either one of those is a signal to us to send you less business. So as a sitter, you could game the system for a little bit, but very quickly we would drop you in search and not send you more business. The opposite happens if you're a dog sitter and you have three, four, five, the customer comes back 10 times, you're playing by the book. We're gonna send you as much new business as you could possibly have. So through the, the algorithms, in addition to all the other things, I mean, you could do, hey, you get a lower commission if you drive more, like Uber will give you more payout after a certain level. There's lots of ways to, to, to do that. Um, I think the two most important things are that you have clarity of messaging. So everyone knows you have to stay on the platform. Like in the beginning, where people didn't know. They'd be like, oh, I have to stay on the platform. So we, you know, you have to make it really clear and you put it in every message and you put it on the top of everything and you say there's a penalty and you, and you say, hey, if you do repeat, we'll give you more business and you give a, so it's just you're constantly hitting it. Um, hi, my husband is an entrepreneur, so I'm sure like your wife. Sorry, sorry to hear. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm sure like your wife understands that means that um, I get pulled into the business automatically. Um, so one of my questions is, um, was there any milestones or goals that you needed to reach before you said, okay, now's the time to go out and find outside capital? I actually thought, I think we, we saw like Airbnb had just come out with like a series A. They just came out and we're like, someone gave them $8 million for sleeping on the couch? Well, they should give us $8 million to watch a dog. And, and that, it was like, the fact that they were able to attract capital in 2011 was definitely eye-opening. and it. What I realized was this business, and frankly, every marketplace business, with very few exceptions, um, only works at scale. And so you need outside capital. So it's not about the milestones, it's about as soon as somebody will give it to you, you take it. Okay. You need the capital to make that business work. Now, not all businesses are like that. Services business, for example, if you're consulting or a digital agency, you're doing development, you can generate cash on your business. You can generate profit margins, but on the marketplace, you know, we would make, the average transaction would be like four nights, 135 bucks. We would take 20% of that. We'd take like $25. Mm -hmm. And that customer costs us probably 100 to acquire. So we lost money on that first transaction. We didn't make money for like 18 months, depending. And I had a competitor who was spending for like a three or four year payback because they were able to raise the money to do it. So in most cases, you, you just take it as soon as you can. This next one's really quick. Um, you know, you talked about like, don't worry about can other people do it as good as you can? Because if you were the person who made up the, you know, the brain child, like obviously in your mind, no one can do it as good as you can. Um, are there jobs that you wish you had given away quicker? Like what are those first jobs you would have handed away as soon as possible? Well, they're all the jobs that I'm handing away now, which by the way is pretty much everything. <laughs> um, it's hard if you don't know what you're good at and it's and bad at and it's hard if you don't if you're not able to attract good people who have industry or domain expertise uh, so last time I didn't have the luxury um, I was not as good as at managing the kind of large-scale operations and managing nested goals and metrics and all the HR stuff and um, I gave that away this time you know I'm give, I gave away the day-to-day -day operations immediately so I have a chief operating officer who's doing everything and I'm doing the fundraising and the business development and the fund and the PR and those things and the people. Thank you. Um, I'm Carrie, so welcome to Miami, even though it's been a couple of months, I think now, but more. Okay, so I want to know, besides the new company that you're already building, what are the other two things, products or services that dog owners are looking for that don't exist yet? 
or maybe they are just ideas, but no one has actually made them come true. And this is according to your one million dog walks. Uh, wait, this was on the email? I was gonna share this magic insight? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm really into uh, health tracking. So like people have the Fitbits or the Apple Watches. Um, we should be able to connect all of our pets' activities to readable data. So you know how much your pet has eaten because you actually can, the food dispenser is tracking the amount of food that goes out. You know how that food is interacting with the body, you know how much activity they're getting, you know their heart rate. They're, so there's, a, there's a, um, a tech play where you're able to kind of track all of your dog's activity, wellness, et cetera, and get out ahead of any health problems that I think is cool. And it will happen soon as the tech matures into it. Um, the other is grooming. Like, grooming is a $5 billion market, and it's a really crappy experience for most people. You have to go to a, a groomer, you wait, you come back, it's dirty, it's smelly. Or you've got these people who come to your house in a van, and the van's dirty and smelly. Um, there's an opportunity to make that, I think, a really delightful customer experience. But it's hard because of the industry is so fragmented. Hey there, uh, thanks again for sharing. Uh, two quick ones for you. What was, the, uh, what was your company's employee headcount at the time that you sold? And in starting your new company, uh, do you have the mindset that you're going to sell it or are you looking to have it be a lifestyle business or so? We had 150 or so when we sold. Um, I feel like a lifestyle business implies that like, it's generating cash and then you're taking that cash and like going spending it on fun stuff. So no, that's not my vision. Um, but my vision isn't also to sell it. I think when you start a business and think about what it takes to sell it, you lose focus on the customer. And really, if you do a great job with your customer, with a business model that makes sense, you will be successful and there will be acquirers or exit options for you. Um, so I think it's really important to say, I'm going to create this thing and not pay attention to the outside and when you're successful, it, it's just gonna happen. Was there another question or did, I got it, okay. Thank you for coming, thank you for being here, telling your story. Um, in now doing this, some angel investing or investing in general, starting this new business, being a father, husband, all that, how do you balance it, how do you um, differentiate, you know, how do you, how do you schedule your day, your week out? I don't work very hard. <laughs> okay, so just to clarify, um, I um, exercise in the morning. I have the kids in the morning, I exercise, and I work from like 11 to 5 or more sometimes, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, we got to be careful because it's, it's really easy to slip back in like, this thing, this call, this, this. I mean, it, you get wrapped up in it when you start a business. So we're, I'm, working it, I'm working through it now. Um, but sleep and exercise and like your family, you've got to prioritize those things. Hey, Aaron, uh, Miles, um, great insights. Thanks for sharing. Um, my question would be, I mean, obviously I think, I think marketplaces take a longer time to develop and, and you are generally going to need outside capital. Um, I'm coming from a B2B SaaS business. We're bootstrapping the company, but you also have experience sitting on the other side of the table, you know, investing in all sorts of different companies, it sounds like. So what would be your general advice um, for raising capital or bootstrapping? Well, it depends on the business. If, if, I mean, if you have a business that's generating cash and you want to own that business, then you should not raise outside capital. If you have a business that in order to be successful, you need that, or to be as successful as you want to be, then, then go for it. And be comfortable with giving up part of the company and some control. I mean, I rem when we raised our seed round, our first million dollars, I immediately lost control of the board. I had a board of three and two of them were investors. I could have gotten fired like three days after we did it. No, I didn't, um, and this time I'm gonna hold on to the board a little bit more tightly. But it really depends on your business and your goal about it. My goal was never to build a business that 
cash flowed a little bit. My goal is to kind of solve this problem and do something big. So we have time for like two or three more questions. I wanted to give this side of the room some love, so. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, so we are in the phase five now. You know, when you had shown previously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, things kind of suck a lot. <laughs> You know, we scale from like 30 employees to 170, and things are breaking quite a bit. And I mean, I'm managing people who are 20 years older, 30 years older than I am. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> what are your tips and stuff for me? I fear that my answer is going to be a lot like my answer to this guy. Um, man, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Do you guys have real clarity on your metrics? Yes. Yeah? Two metrics, right? And do you have people on the executive team who are managing down and managing the teams towards those metrics? Um, we have two executives, CEO and Ah, okay. Yeah. Right, but um, still driving that is hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm not knowing the details of your company, so take it with, all with a grain of salt, but I think it's important to have that kind of oversight. So whatever those functions are, whether it's as a nonprofit, I don't know if it's marketing, sales, or distribution, whatever it is, but someone needs to own that and align the team on those one or two goals, report that back to you, and then you're not worried about these 70 people. You know, you've got to trust them with those 70 people. So you probably need to get one or two additional layers of, of management. So our, our management is to be a layer, but what you're saying is maybe in addition to that layer, you should have people who are maybe owning the two metrics. Yes. Metrics. Yes, you, you need to have, I mean, like, because usually the metrics, it depends on the business, but sometimes they cut across departments. Sometimes a single department has control over that. And you have to be very clear over, like, who has these levers to pull and what their constraints are. Happy to chat about it more. It's hard to know without knowing more about your business. Yeah. So last question, the pressure's on to make it a good one. And I one. can hang out for a couple minutes. Oh yeah, okay, so never mind, a few more. No, but I can hang out if people want to come over or whatever, you can spare people to. Hi Aaron, my name's Sebastian, local entrepreneur. Um, lots of entrepreneurs in the room looking to fundraise. What are your verticals, uh, what companies have you invested in the last year? Um, and what are you looking for mostly in terms of industry right now, apart from dogs? And I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a dog investor necessarily. I, I'm pretty industry agnostic. Um, this is probably, like one and two are probably the most important to me. Right place, right time. And, and like you have a, as a founder have a reason to be there. And then if it's not something that's like really boring, <laughs> I'm probably interested, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, a lot of times at the seed stage, you won't be able to talk about an extreme focus. Like you, don't, you haven't executed much yet, or you haven't, you don't understand your critical metrics because you don't really have a business yet. I don't, again, I don't know what your situation is. Um, so yeah, I think it's, Something good. Now I tend to see more probably, I see all the pet stuff. Um, I see a lot of consumer stuff. I see a lot of marketplace stuff, but I'm open to anything. Round of applause for Aaron.